Hello, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy Easter to everyone. Fun fact, it is still Easter tide. It is 50 days of feasting in the glory of the resurrection. Welcome to everybody here in the room, everybody online, all of the families here on Family Sunday. It's a great day to be together in church. Uh, there is a greeting in the church called the Paschal Greeting, the Easter Greeting. And we're gonna start with that this morning. You'll see it up on the screen. Can we put that up there for me, Donald? I'm gonna say the first part where it's underlined. We'll say that out loud together. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's gonna be a wonderful service together today. We will sing together, we'll pray together, hear the scriptures, hear uh, preaching, and we'll come together to the table of the Lord. If you're joining us online, get your communion elements ready to participate with us. Would you stand together with us and let us confess our intentions today in worship with our confession of worship. We have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to this moment to worship God. We have come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are not here to be entertained. We are here to encounter the sacred. We are not consumers, we are worshipers. We praise and adore the living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
A reading from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand and his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Amen. As we're talking about believing in Jesus, that we may have life in him, together today can we declare our faith by saying the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
to be together in the house of God with the people of God in the presence of God. It's so special for me every, every month having a family service, getting to come together and all of us, the family of God being reminded of who we are and whose we are. As we uh, finish this, this part of the worship service, I wanted to pray the prayer for this week. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation. Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen and amen, amen. Well, would you turn to one another, share the love of God with the people around you and you can have a seat. Welcome everyone to Word of Life Church in the season of Easter, Christ is risen. All right, some of you are getting it. Welcome to those of you who uh, came back after last Sunday. Wasn't last Sunday just a tremendous time of worship in the house of the Lord? You know, I, so much of it is God's presence with us. And for last Easter 
service last Sunday, a lot of it too was the pancakes. Can I get a witness? Like that helps. Some of y'all been skipping breakfast on Sunday morning. You need to be eating pancakes before you come to church. But welcome everybody to Word of Life. My name is Derek. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you are our guest, if you're here in person and you're our guest today, uh, welcome. Glad that you are here. And if this is your first time or one of the first times that you've worshiped with us, if you wouldn't mind filling out a connect card that is in the pew back right in front of you, you'll see a holder with a whole bunch of cards and pens. Uh, parents, feel free to let your kids scribble on those things. That's fine. That happens. That's good. Uh, but if you're our guest, if you would fill out a connect card and then put it in an offering bucket in just a moment, we'd love to connect with you who are our guests in person. And if you are new to Word of Life online, welcome to our live stream. We have online worshipers all over North America and Europe and New Zealand and wherever you are. If you've joined us online and you're new to our online stream, we have a form for you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out at wolc.com forward slash connect and we'll reach out to you onliners. Well, let's get ready now to worship the Lord through giving. Uh, both those of you who are online and those of you who are here in the building, let's get our tithes, our offerings ready to worship the Lord through giving. Uh, here in the building, there are offering envelopes uh, that you can use and everyone can text to give. You can use the app. You can use the uh, newly updated wolc.com website. Did you know we have a whole upgrade on our website? I love the new website. Uh, and there's a place for you to give there if you'd like to give that way. And as we give, I think particularly as we think about giving in the season of Easter, that giving should produce within us a little bit of joy. I mean, Jesus said you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. And, you know, God loves everybody. We know that. But God loves particularly those who are not just givers, but cheerful givers. And so we give Sunday after Sunday in the offering as, as a token, as an expression of our love and devotion for God. So thank you for your generosity and your sacrificial gifts Let's uh, pray together as we give in our offering. I'll pray over the offering and then we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray as we give. Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are gathered together in person, online, in this moment to worship you with all that we are. And Lord, in this sacred moment, we come to worship you through the giving of tithes and offerings. Lord, receive this offering. Receive it, Lord, with the joy in which we are giving it today. We do give in faith and joy, and we give in Jesus' name. And now, church, join me. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. We'll go ahead and pass offering buckets. And while the buckets are being passed, I am here to remind you of things that are happening during Easter tide, during the season of Easter, and even into the summer. Uh, happy to announce our next men's breakfast is coming up Saturday, April the 20th, 9 a.m. in the Life Center. We had a great time uh, together with the fellas uh, last month. And so we're getting together. Uh, there'll be a meal. There's, of course, a breakfast. We're having one of our own who's gonna be sharing his testimony. And then, fellas, we're going to be talking about some of the ideas that were generated in our last breakfast about what we can do together going on into the summer. And so if you came to the breakfast, fellas, come on back, get signed up for your online. And if you missed the breakfast in March, you are welcome, uh, fellas, to join us for this men's breakfast. It's going to be good. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we're not forgetting the ladies. There is a ladies' afternoon tea 
which is coming up next Saturday, April the 13th, two to four in the Life Center. Uh, ladies do get signed up for the afternoon tea. You can get signed up in the foyer or uh, online. You know, we have QR codes in the pew back in front of you. For any of our events, you can find that online registration information by using the QR code. Uh, but ladies do get signed up. You also have to share what kind of food you're bringing. So ladies get signed up for that. And uh, then did anyone notice the giant balloon octopus that's in the foyer? Uh, did you notice that come into church last Sunday and this Sunday? Yeah, we got some kids who noticed the balloon octopus. We announced last Sunday dates uh, for VBS, which is July 15th through the 18th, and registration is open for VBS. Uh, we also announced uh, dates and registration is open for MYC Summer Camp. Uh, summer Camp for students coming up July 29th through August 2nd. And registration is open for both of these. And I encourage you, parents, grandparents, get your kids signed up for VBS for MYC Summer Camp. And to keep the excitement going, we got a little video to share with you. Another hot one out there. Temps reaching over 100 degrees today. Hope you're keeping cool and having fun on this hot summer day. Now, let's get back. High school, middle school students excited for MYC camp this year. Let me hear ya. All right. Any, any kids from kids camp in here excited for VBS? Kids, let me hear ya. Shoot, look at those kids. They're ready for VBS. 
Well, welcome everyone into the Easter season. And uh, I'm glad that we have the kids from Kids Camp in here and our students from uh, 678. You guys are in here worshiping with mom and dad. Uh, this is a time to celebrate the joy that we have, this joy that comes from the resurrection of Jesus. Easter, which is not just one day, it's a season, 50 days, right? Seven weeks, you get seven weeks of joy. All right, so seven, so Lent is about fasting, right? Lent is about not eating certain things. But see, in the, in the Easter season, Lent is over. Easter is here. It's for feasting. And so keep eating that Easter candy. Just keep eating that Easter candy all seven weeks. I'm sure they got it half price in the stores. So keep the joy going because Christ is risen. Rock on kids louder than moms and dads in here. I love it. I love it. The resurrection of Jesus in this season of Easter, it is a celebration of Jesus' defeat of death, but it's also a celebration of the beginning of God's new creation project. And there's a couple of different ways to think about the resurrection of Jesus. One way I think about the resurrection of Jesus is to think about his resurrection as the first step in his ascension. Think about it like this. Jesus was in heaven in the glory of his Father with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus descended from heaven down into humanity, right? He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he became a human being just like us, and then he grew up, and he had a ministry, and he was teaching, and he was preaching. He was casting out demons. He was healing the sick, and then Jesus descends from humanity into suffering humanity, Right? That's Good Friday stuff. That's extinguishing the candle stuff. Jesus descends from humanity into suffering humanity. And then on that Good Friday, Jesus breathes his last and he descends as far down as you can go all the way into death itself. Holy Saturday, Christ is dead in the tomb. But you know, sorrow endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning because on that first Easter Sunday, Jesus is, he rises from the dead and that's the first step of ascension. And he meets with his disciples. He met with Thomas and the disciples. You heard that today in the gospel reading. And then he ultimately then ascends back to the right hand of the father. That's one way to think about the resurrection of Jesus. Another way of thinking about the resurrection requires a little bit of some science fiction imagination, right? Where are my science fiction fans? Let me see where you're at. Let me see. Oh, this is gonna be a hard sell. That was about 10% of you. Okay, dokie. All right, so for those of you who aren't sci-fi fans, I want you to kind of work with me just a little bit. I want you to imagine the resurrection of Jesus like creating a wormhole. Do you know about wormholes? Wormholes, which you'll see in science fiction books and movies, you know, it featured predominantly in Interstellar. You know, that, you know Interstellar, that movie, that, that's a 2014 movie. That was 10 years ago. I think you can still watch it on Netflix. Uh, but there's wormholes in, you know, the 90s movies like Stargate, uh, Contact with Jodie Foster. All right, any of my 70, 80 babies out there watching 90s movies, okay. Contact, I love that movie. It was based on the Carl Sagan book. I like the book, I like the movie. Um, you can also see wormholes in the Marvel movies, all right? So though you millennials, you know about the Marvel movies, there's wormholes all over the place. But the wormhole is a theoretical concept that there is a point in time and space that opens up and there's this passageway, there's this tunnel to another more distant point in time and space, and that this wormhole becomes like a little shortcut. Now, it's in the science fiction world, but it's actually based in Einstein's theory of relativity, which I will not pretend to be able to explain to you. Just Google it. Don't Google it now, but after church, Google wormholes, and you can learn all you want to learn. But I like to think of the resurrection like that, that Jesus didn't just go down into death and come up out of death which again, you can do it that way. You can think about it that way. 
But I like to think of the resurrection as Jesus going into death and creating a wormhole by busting through death, going through the other side of death and creating a passageway from this old broken down world into God's new world where all things are made new. I like to think of resurrection like that, that Jesus on our behalf and for us has created this passageway, this wormhole. And if we're thinking about resurrection like that, then what Jesus came to do is to open up a doorway into a new life. And that's what I wanna talk about today, a doorway into a new life. Lent is a season where we recognize that things are dying and there are things that need to die. But in Easter, we're celebrating new life because there's things in your life that need to become new. Anybody else looking for some, something new to come in your life in this season? Anybody, is it just me? Anybody? New life. So if Jesus has come to create this wormhole through his resurrection, this doorway to new life, then we can begin to see what I think is the good news of Easter. And that is God is making everything new. What God did for Jesus on that first Easter Sunday, God wants to do for the whole cosmos, wants to make everything new, wants to raise everything from the dead. But this includes you and me. We get in on this, all things being made new. So here in the season of Easter, I want us to reflect on this doorway that Jesus is opening that we might walk into it into a new life. Because God is making all things new, including me and you. Second Corinthians chapter five, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. has, Has anyone really, have you experienced that? Right? Can you testify to that kind of, yeah, I, I, came, I came and gave my life to Jesus and now I'm becoming a new person. Can anyone testify to that? Can anyone say, yeah, that's me. I've experienced that. Because I can for sure. Because 34 years ago when I was 15 years old, yeah, you can do the math. I'm 49, I'm turning 50 this year, right? If you wanna buy me a present, I'm an extra large. I was 15 years old and I was at a pivotal point in my life. Middle school students, high school students, listen to me. I was 15 years old and I was at a pivotal point in my life because I didn't know where I was going, what I was gonna do, if I was even a person worthy of love. And then I did what you teenagers are doing. I came to church and I heard the gospel for God so loved the world and everybody in it. And about 34, just over 34 years ago, I read one verse from the Bible, Psalm 37, five, which says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he will do it. And when I was 15 years old and I did not know much about church or religion or Jesus or God, I did what that one line in Psalm 37 said. And I prayed a prayer and I gave my life to Jesus. I committed my life to Jesus. I went all in with Jesus and I haven't regretted that a moment of my entire life. It became for me the passageway into a new life. Praying that prayer 34 years ago was that for me, doorway into a brand new life. And so Jesus is offering and inviting for you to enter through that same doorway because I got good news today. And that is God wants to rescue you. God wants to transform you. This, this churchy word that we use, salvation, is about what God wants to do, yes, for the whole creation, but you're a part of that creation. He wants to rescue you and make you new. And not only is God doing this, but God invites us to participate in that rescuing and transforming work. If you have a Bible, I'm gonna invite you to go with me to Ephesians chapter four in the New Testament. So 
if you have a, a physical Bible, you can find that. If you need the table of contents, there's no shame in that. You can find Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And if you don't have a physical Bible, if you have a Bible app, uh, swipe open that Bible app, find Ephesians chapter four. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have a Bible app, don't worry, all the Bible verses will be up on the screen. But I want us to spend a little bit of time today in Ephesians chapter four, because it's in here, I believe, that we're gonna see this doorway into a new life and what we can do to participate in God's work of renewing us and making us new. So Ephesians chapter four, let's start towards the end of the chapter. Ephesians chapter four, verse 21. This is the apostle Paul who wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, instructing them as resurrection people, as Jesus people, that this is what it looks like to live this Jesus life. Ephesians chapter four, I'm gonna start verse 21. Since you have heard about Jesus, and have learned the truth that comes from him. Pause for just a second. Since you have heard about Jesus and learned the truth about Jesus, what is it that, that you've learned? What, what have you learned? What is this truth you have heard of that's coming from Jesus? You know, here at Word of Life Church, we're a, we're a Jesus church. People often ask me, what kind of church is Word of Life? You know, well, we're non-denominational, but that's what we're not. <laughs> we're not opposed to denominations. We're just not a part of one. That doesn't help. I think when people ask me, what kind of church is Word of Life? I say, we're a Jesus church, right? We make a really, really big deal of Jesus. So we teach the ways of Jesus here. That's, that's a part of what we do as a Jesus church. And I think what is perhaps most foundational in what we've learned from Jesus is that God is not for us. I mean, God is not against us. God is for us. That God's love is directed towards us. And that love is experiential because God is with us. I think this is what's most foundational, that God is with us. So wherever you are today in your journey, maybe it's a good day, maybe it's a tough day. This is what's most foundational and what Jesus came to communicate. And that is God is with us. God is for us and not against us. In, in understanding this truth, what we've come to see is that with, with God with us and God being for us, it's not only for our benefit, but God is also for our enemies too, right? This is some of the things that we're we're learning from Jesus, the truth we're seeing in Jesus, that God is far more merciful than we assumed. Isn't that true? God is way more merciful than some of us have thought. God has come to rescue us. This is the truth we've seen in Jesus. God wants us to walk in the ways of God. God has come to rule. God's kingdom has come. All right, so these are some of the things that we have heard and we have learned from Jesus. God is for us, not against us. God is with us. We're walking in his ways. Okay, now let's continue on. Verse 22. Since you have heard about Jesus, you've learned these things. Verse 22, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. God has come to rescue us and the way that we participate in that rescuing, transforming work is by throwing off, literally stripping off everything associated with our old life, our old nature. That is that, that, that old way of thinking, that old identity that we had before Jesus. We have to throw it off, or the, the Greek word translated throw off is more literally strip off. Like, like soaked, soiled, dirty, nasty clothes that you have to strip off. Have you ever got caught in the rain without an umbrella and you get like totally soaked to the bone to like where all your clothes are like, like stuck to your body? Don't you hate that feeling? Ever, ever get caught in the rain and you get so soaked, by, but by the time you get home, the first thing you do is you pull your phone out of your pocket, make sure it's not dead. Okay, phone is not dead. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna strip off 
those wet clothes because you, you want to get dry. That's, that's the image here of throwing off your old sinful nature. It's much more like stripping things off. We participate in God's work of transforming us, rescuing us, by stripping off everything associated with our old life. Stripping it off like stripping off clothes. But... That's not the end of the story. God doesn't want us running around naked, all right? Verse 23, instead, so in after you have stripped off your old way of life, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now, notice here that it is the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to renew us, to transform us, to change us. The Spirit is giving us new thoughts and a new attitude. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth who will guide us into all truth. So it is the work of the Spirit to change us because we're not really changing ourselves. This is the big step that some people have to make in their faith journey when they recognize that you are no longer in charge of your life. If you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, if you have said yes to Jesus, if you've committed your life to Jesus, then you're no longer in the driver's seat. God is. Jesus is the one who's in charge of your life. So we're not even changing our life. That's all God's work. That's the, the work of the Holy Spirit. But we can choose to work with what the Holy Spirit is doing to give us a new life and new thoughts and attitudes, or we can do things that work against what the Holy Spirit is doing. And the way that we work with the Spirit is we consciously and very often daily have to strip off old ways of thinking, old ways of looking at people, old attitudes and thoughts and a way of living. We have to actively strip those things off. So what Paul's doing here in Ephesians 4 is he's giving us an image. Do, do you see the image? Do you see the exchange that's taking place? We walk through this door. We're being led by Jesus. The Spirit is changing us, but we have a responsibility. We got to change out our clothes, out with the old, in with the new. So before Jesus, the way you thought of yourself, your own identity, right? Maybe that was good, maybe that was not so good. That has to change. The way you looked at people, the way you were judging people, old attitudes, old thoughts, that's, that's all that old life stuff. We have to strip that off and instead put on our new nature. And did you notice what Paul said there? Put on a new nature created to be like God. So the new nature, the new self, the new thoughts, the new attitudes, the new way of looking at other people, the new way of looking at yourself is in a mirror reflection to what God looks like, to what the God revealed in Jesus looks like. In other words, in this exchange, we're stripping off everything that doesn't look like Jesus and we're putting on everything that does look like Jesus. So what are some of those things that we need to strip off? Well, Paul goes on to talk about things like lying, anger, stealing, abusive words. Let's check it out. Verse 25. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all parts of the same body. So you can't be lying and spreading false rumors about people in this new way of Jesus. You got to strip that off. And why do we strip that off? Because that's not a part of our new nature created to be like God because God doesn't lie. Do you see how that works? We're stripping off everything that doesn't look like the God revealed in Jesus. God doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't lie. So we got to strip off habits of lying. Look at verse 26. What about anger? Verse 26 and verse 27. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Master Yoda said, fear is a pathway to the dark side of the force. 
for my Star Wars science fiction friends. There you go. Apostle Paul says, anger gives a foothold to the devil. And I think they're saying the same thing. Now, traditionally, I'm reading here from the New Living Translation, a more modern translation. Traditionally, verse 26 says, be angry and sin not. Anybody remember that one? Be angry and sin not. Well, what does it mean to be angry and sin not? The New Living Translation nails it. It means don't sin by letting anger control you. Remember, feeling angry is not wrong. It's not a sin to feel angry, right? Even Jesus got angry. Follow Jesus in the Gospels. There's times Jesus got angry. No, it was not in the temple with the overturning of the tables. Everybody wants to think that was a fit of rage, and it wasn't. That was something totally different. But if you read the Gospels close enough, Jesus often was getting mad at his disciples when they were acting like a bunch of knuckleheads, right? Like Jesus is driving the minivan and don't make me pull this around, you kids knock it off back there, right? Jesus felt that, right? So we can feel angry. Feeling, feeling angry is a normal human response. Nothing wrong with that. But remember that anger is to the soul what pain is to the body it's an indication that something's not right. So it's fine to get angry, we all do. You just can't hold on to that anger, right? You can't, can't, you, you can't nurture that anger. You have to strip it off. It's one of those things that we have to strip off. Angry people who live in a perpetual state of rage give ground to the devil. That's what Paul is saying. And so we have to strip off anger. Why do we strip off anger? Because that is not a part of our new nature created to be like God, because God's not angry. All right, more on that in a moment. Next verse, verse 28. Let's keep it moving. Verse 28. What else are we stripping off? If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Love how simple it is, right? If you're stealing stuff, stop it, <laughs> right? That's, all you kleptomaniacs out there, get a job and stop stealing stuff, right? That's all that Paul's saying here. Now I know that that perhaps is not a lot of us, but think it through. Why do we strip off bad habits like stealing? Because stealing is not who we are in our new nature created to be like God because God is not stealing. God isn't a taker, God is a giver. What about the way we talk to people? Look at verse 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Abusive language, that gets at the heart of what we gotta strip off, right? We can't use our words to beat people up or to belittle or to bully people. That belongs to the old life, right? And so when you hear people using their words to beat people up, to belittle, to bully people, that's just the, that's old sinful life stuff. We have to strip that kind of stuff off. Instead, we want to use our words to build people up. In other words, we want to use our words not to curse people, but to bless people. And so why do we have to strip off abusive language that bullies and belittles? Because that's not our new nature created to be like God, because God doesn't use God's own words to bully or belittle people. God uses words to bless and to build people up. You know, the very word blessing simply means to say a good word. So maybe you're seeing a pattern emerging here. Next verse, verse 30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. How you live matters. So don't walk in such a way that it grieves or saddens the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit who is in you. He's identified you. He has sealed you for the day of redemption. And it's the Holy Spirit who is transforming and changing us from the inside out. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. 
It's the, it's the Holy Spirit that's empowering us to walk through this doorway into a new life. And then finally, we end up in verses 31 and 32 of Ephesians 4, and this is a final challenge. This is how Paul's wrapping up this, this thought. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So there it is one more time. And I really believe that Paul is being emphatic here. We have to strip off bitterness, malice, rage, anger. We have to strip those things off. And why? Because that is not what God is like. God is not a strange mixture of love and anger, love and wrath, to where sometimes you're going to get the angry God, and sometimes you're going to get the loving God. God is not a mixture in God's own essence in being. God is love, supreme love never-ending love and a kind of love that's not mixed with anger. There's no anger in the nature of God. Now, there are plenty of references throughout Scripture of the anger of God, the wrath of God, but these are not literal descriptions of God's character or nature. These are rather metaphors. Whenever you see anger or wrath of God, in your Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, if you can simply swap out the word anger for judgment, because the anger wrath of God is a metaphor that is communicating something true, not a literal truth, a metaphorical truth. It is pointing us to the fact that we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus. Like nobody's getting away with anything. All right, we're all going to stand before Jesus because as we've confessed in our Christian faith, we believe that Jesus is coming to judge the living and the dead. So anger, when we read that in the Bible, is not a literal attribute of God, but rather it's a metaphor. And, and metaphorical language is how Scripture talks about God. I mean, think about all the different references throughout the Bible in describing God. You know, it's, there's this idea that uh, the Bible speaks of the wings of God, right? And God doesn't have literal wings, but God covers all. The Bible talks about the eyes of God. And God doesn't have literal eyes, but God sees all. You know, the Bible will even speak of the righteous right arm of God. And God doesn't literally have a right arm, but God is all powerful. The Bible will speak of the mind of God and God doesn't have a literal brain, but rather God knows all. And so the Bible talks about the anger of God and God doesn't have literal anger, but God judges all. We have to strip off all of these things if we're going to progress in this way of new life. So if you are wanting a new life, then it's time to strip off these things and then put on things like tenderheartedness and kindness. Because those are the things that belong to our new nature created in the image of God. We're instructed to be kind, to be tenderhearted, to be forgiving because that's what God is like. God is kind. God is tenderhearted. God is forgiveness. So we want to put those things on while we are stripping off the old. And I don't know what it is for you this Easter season that you need to strip off and to put on. But maybe we can take just a few moments to acknowledge the presence of God with us. And maybe before we come to the Lord's table to celebrate Holy Communion, you think just a moment on what is it in my life right now that doesn't look like the God revealed in Jesus? 
Like where right now in my life do I not look like Jesus? And then think, okay, now what do I need to do to strip off old attitudes or an old way of thinking, an old identity? Because maybe you've struggled with some area of your life that doesn't look like Jesus and it's almost become your identity. That, when it becomes your identity, your, your sense of your own self-understanding, that's when you gotta strip that off. And see, there's, there's grace today. There's mercy today because God the Holy Spirit is in the process of changing us. And, and maybe you have you know, kind of shed some old bad habits or ways of thinking, but they continue to pop back up. Anytime for me, when those, those old, old life stuff pops up in my own heart, I just remind myself, that's not who you are. That's, that's your old life. That's not who you are. Because we are together being formed into the image of Jesus. And this brings great joy to God, our Father. Let's prepare ourselves for Holy Communion. If you're here in the sanctuary, uh, stand up with me. And let's prepare ourselves because we don't, we don't ever want to rush to the table. Right? We don't want to rush to the table. There's always a, a, a preparation time. And see, some of you, maybe you haven't said yes to Jesus yet. Maybe some of you haven't, like me when I was 15, made that commitment. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to give him control of my life. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Because in a moment, we're gonna pray a prayer of confession together. It's a, confess, a confession of sin. And you're invited to confess that sin and say this prayer with us. But maybe for you today, this could be your moment of saying, yes, I'm following Jesus. I'm gonna commit my life to the Lord, trust also in him and believe that he will do it. Holy communion has a way of being a little bit of a, of a wormhole. Holy Communion is a little bit of a portal that allows us to connect with Christ crucified and risen again. So church, let's prepare ourselves by this confession of sin. And then you'll be invited. Everyone is invited to celebrate communion. Ushers will direct you and where to go. Those of you who are online, you are invited to have some communion elements and to join us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But first... Let's confess our sins together. Join me, church. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And now this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. It is the Lord's will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. There was a moment when the lights went out and death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sin Every curse is blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But 
not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens rose
Amen, amen. It is Easter tide. Christ is risen. I want you to go with that Easter joy into this week. Uh, that's a part of, you know, stripping off old stuff, putting on new stuff, is putting on a joy that comes from our faith, that comes from our heart, and then spreading that joy. We need a little bit more joy in our world. So go out, spread that Easter joy. Uh, if you are new to Word of Life Church, and this is your first time with us here in person, uh, go by the welcome kiosk. There's some nice people there. They have a gift for you. They'd like to say hello. And then if you would like prayer, uh, we invite you to come find some of our prayer teams who will be down here at the front after the service. And if you can't find anybody to pray for you in here, I'll be in the foyer. Come find me. I'll pray for you. But let me send you out now with a blessing. Speak this good word over you. Let me send you out into your week now with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you. Go in peace.